our moderator for this panel, Laura Schmidt, is um, one of the most effective policy researchers in the world. She's behind many initiatives like the San Francisco and Berkeley soda tax. She won't tell you that herself because that's not her job today. She's also my co-PI on the whole grant, the, U the University of California Office of the President grant that funds this symposium and our work on sugar science and research. Thank you so much. It's Thanks. such an honor to work with you. <laughs> Will, <laughs> Will the panelists, I'm summoning my panelists, all three of them. So um, I'm a sociologist and public health researcher, and we have a word for this uh, toxic problem uh, in sociology. We call it a wicked problem. And the reason we use that word is because to, to us what it means is it's institutionalized. It's baked into the society the way things work. And everything in the society is reinforcing the status quo. So there are, in the economy, there are vested interests that want to keep the problem going or need to keep the problem going. We as individuals, because it's invisible, it's not right in front of us until we get sick, uh, we keep it going. And so this is the, the political and um, uh, social change problem that we're looking at here. And fortunately, uh, there are strategies and mechanisms in societies that can take a wicked problem and fix it. And that's obviously what needs to happen here. Uh, because they're so deeply institutionalized, it's not easy. One issue is raising awareness, which is what we're doing here. But really, if you look at, um, at uh, social change around the world, big revolutions, social revolutions, what you see is a combination of change from the top and change from the bottom up. And those two things need to happen, and they need to happen powerfully, and they need to come together in the middle. And so any social revolution, any civil rights movement, you'll see there's agitation and activism and advocacy coming from civil society from the bottom up. And then there's change happening up in the stratosphere of politics as usual. There are people who start to wake up and they say, hey, I'm a decision maker in a position of power and I can do something about this problem. And you need people working between the two levels to bring that information up from the bottom to the top and back down. And so what we have today on our panel, uh, and I'm honored to, to introduce you all, is three representatives of this process. People who are working in, in the advocacy world and people who are working with corporations trying to enlighten corporations and people who are working with in the policy realm. So um, first of all, Meg Schwartzman uh, is here from UC Berkeley. She's in the Occupational and Environmental Health uh, uh, Center and the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry. Uh, and she, I, what I love about her story is that she got her start uh, working as a primary care doctor, uh, treating kids with asthma. And what happened was she started to realize that these kids lived around Superfund sites, toxic waste dumps. And that mobilized her to go to school and get a, a degree in environmental health. And now she's a, in, 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 at the University of California doing this kind of work. And uh, so, and she works with policymakers, but also uh, with businesses to try to figure out strategies for uh, reducing this horrible burden that we all face with chemical exposures. And then Jean Rizzo is a, a pretty big powerhouse in the advocacy world. And uh, she uses science to mobilize activism around these issues, and she's got a table out here. And um, so if you think about it, uh, we're all consumers. We might not be uh, willing to join a social movement around this issue yet, maybe we are, but we can engage in activism even just in what we buy. And, and we, I think that uh, Jenny's talk just um, leading up to this really gave us some suggestions for ways to use our consumer p uh, power as an ingredient for social change. And then finally, Lauren Zeiss, uh, she works within government uh, at, at the state of California and works with policymakers, and she's a scientist, but she tries to inform people up in that stratosphere of politics as usual about what we need to do 
uh, around this issue. And hopefully we'll get to hear about California's amazing uh, policy intervention. I think it's the force field that keeps us as Californians a little safer. It's called Proposition 65, and it regulates this stuff. So hopefully we'll hear from Lauren about that. So um, each of our panelists is going to just speak for a few minutes about uh, their worldview and what they do for a living and how they fit into this puzzle of social change in this area. And then we're going to uh, have a little Q&A. So uh, maybe start with Meg. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and as Laura said, um, it was my sort of frustration as a clinician being able to address the root causes of my patient's illness that led me back to school after the grueling um, experience of medical education and residency um, um, uh, to look, to sort of work at a larger scale and to look at the environmental contributors to disease. Um, something that was also really influential for me is that around that same time, I read Sandra Steingraber's book, Having Faith, An Ecologist's Journey to uh, Motherhood, and I recommend it to everybody. Um, Sandra Steingraber is an ecologist, and it was my real introduction to the role that chemicals in the environment can play in altering our development and increasing risk of disease. Um, and she's a beautiful writer, and it really did influence my um, career path. So um, after getting my master's in environmental health, um, I started working on this question of what to do about our exposures to synthetic chemicals and pollutants that are in the products that we use, that are in our built environment, that are in electronics, um, clothing, our workplaces, um, um, our bodies, our environments. Um, and there's a lot that this, of science that still needs to be done, um, particularly around understanding the health impacts that we've been talking about today, sort of the newer science on endpoints like um, neurodevelopment or um, obesity, the way we've been talking about. Um, but there's also a lot, of, a lot that we already know and we need to be taking action on some of those at the same time as we're increasing the science. Um, so um, the question is how to do that, how to take action on the hazards that we understand well without inadvertently uh, perpetuating the problem. So there's plenty of examples from um, something that we've studied in our center, um, workers' exposures to um, N-hexane, which is a solvent that's in brake cleaners, um, and the serial substitutions that have happened just in that one product sector um, that have moved from you know, chemicals that caused reproductive harm to chemicals that um, caused young workers, mechanics, to um, lose the use, the strength of their hands and legs, um, and how this, um, uh, elimination or um, ban on a single substance in the absence of guidance about what to use instead can um, generate a problem that's as bad as or worse than um, what we were trying to um, avoid or what was being used before. And so this was the question that interested me very much is how we take action on chemicals that we know are hazardous or suspect are hazardous without, um, with some guidance about what could be safer um, and not just perpetuate the problem. So um, we started the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry um, with this in mind, and it's a collaboration among um, the Colleges of Chemistry and Public Health, Environmental Health Sciences, College of Natural Resources, um, Engineering, Business, and actually Law also, to apply the science on toxics to these questions. Um, and I want to describe two, briefly two efforts to tell you a couple stories. Um, one is um, about, that connects teaching and research with world, real world problems, and the other is some policy efforts. And I would sort these into what we call sort of supply side and demand side. Um, when we think about sort of levers of change, we can often sort them into those two bins, and I'll explain. So on the teaching and research connected to real world problems side, we started a course six years ago, seven years ago, called Greener Solutions, and there's at least one student here today of this fall's class. And it connects, it. we create um, um, interdisciplinary groups of graduate students, engineers, chemists, and environmental health scientists, and link them with a company who's trying to find a safer alternative to a chemical of concern in their product or their manufacturing process. So, um, and they, um, I'll give you, I'll explain it through examples. So one year we worked with um, 
Levi's, who also owns the Dockers brand. And Dockers kind of was the preeminent brand of making permanent press trousers, right? Um, and the way that permanent press is achieved is with formaldehyde. And it's not an exposure that we worry about as consumers because the formaldehyde is a resin at that point and bond bound, but um, it's a serious exposure for workers because before the, chem the resin is cured, there's very high exposure to formaldehyde. And so they were looking for how do you um, create that permanent press and that crease without using formaldehyde. And what our team did is um, look at what that chemical function is. It's cross-linking cellulose. And then where in nature does biology cross-link? Because biology tends to do things in a less toxic way than humanity. <laughs> We're part of biology, but we may not be the <laughs> smartest part. Um, so um, what they ended up coming with, up with several creative um, solutions, including one that was sort of enzyme-based. And, and this project went on to have further life. And it ended up um, sort of being condensed because it caused a color, and then further research looked into how to use that as a dye, as a safer dye. So it doesn't always solve the problem, but we always come up with interesting things. Um, we've worked in the past and again this year with Method, um, you know, the makers of soap and laundry detergent and all of that, looking at safer ways to preserve their products. Um, and also at Safer Surfactants, and some of that research has gone on and employed one of our graduates, two of our graduates, um, uh, permanent positions, um, and led to product changes in methods, um, products that are saving tens of thousands of pounds of release into the environment of pesticides per year, and million pounds of release of surfactants into the, just through method project products, and Method is one of those very open companies that's trying to get their solutions taken up through the whole industry sector, not just use it as a competitive an advantage in their product. Um, so I would call that a supply side solution where we're working on generating safer alternatives with companies who are already enlightened and already trying to do the right thing. And the second example I want to give you is a demand side sort of lever, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because my seven minutes are almost up, but just to sort of show you the range of ways to intervene, um, we, I've also been very active in supporting policymaking at the state level. I didn't know it was going to ring. Sorry about that. Um, and um, one of the uh, programs that I've gotten to um, work with over the years is in California um, EPA, which whose Department of Toxic Substances Control is the lead on um, one of the more innovative chemicals policies that is anywhere in the world, much less the state, um, which is the Safer Consumer Products Program. And I'll just say very briefly that the core of it that makes it so interesting is that when they designate a priority product, which is a chemical of concern in a product of concern, like, for example, flame retardants in children's nap mats, um, which they've done, or um, uh, methylene chloride in graffiti removers and other solvents, um, they don't just say, we're going to ban this chemical in this use. They say, um, if, um, if you use this chemical in this product type, you need to do an alternatives analysis. What else is there that could do this job, either a chemical that could do it more safely, or could you scrub that graffiti off and not use a chemical at all? So just that lens of um, n not jumping in to ban a chemical, but asking in a very broad way what could be safe what could be a safer way to accomplish this function is a regulatory um, demand side this way that's meant to uh, create demand for safer alternatives so we're sort of working in both of those ways and I'll stop there boy am I glad to have people like yeah. this Jean sure okay fine hi so first of all, my name is Jeannie Rizzo. I'm with Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. And I came to this work with the perfect resume of being a nurse, a nightclub owner, and a film and theater and music producer. So in case you're thinking there's a PhD here, there's not. So that gives me great pleasure and honor to work with the two other women at this table. So they are gurus to me. Uh, we're on a collision course with chemicals and their impact on our health. We heard about that all day today, compounded by all the place-based exposures in our homes, workplaces, where our kids play, what we eat every day. But it's not just by science alone that we know this. You know it, right? You know it. We know it in our lives, in the suffering, in who we know, and who's not well. 
So I consider us all advocates here today because we're part of what I call the endocrine system of change. <laughs> so like EDCs, we're the organizers, we're the messengers, we're the activators, and we're the positive disruptors of a system. So if you think about it, if you think about yourself in those terms, we can actually imagine how we can make that change. And we have the right to know what we're exposed to, but we also have the responsibility to act. <clears throat> That's where we come in. We focus on the preventable causes of breast cancer, toxic chemicals related to the disease, and we place ourselves in the middle of that toxic system. But we rely on the scientists. We rely on that as the basis of our work to tell us chemicals that, are, that are, have the potential to cause harm, to provide us with the knowledge and to sound the alarm. As Tracy Woodruff would say, <clears throat> navigating that science, and as you just discussed, determining when to act is something that's debated every day at kitchen tables, in boardrooms, at research convenings, at government and legislature. So we start with the fact that we have an increased incidence of breast cancer. You've heard all about the increased incidence of obesity. That's a fact. We know the age of puberty is changing. We know that young girls are breast budding earlier and earlier. We know that a significant percentage of breast cancer is related to toxic chemical exposure. So I want to share a journey that we took with endocrine disruptors at the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, which, as you know, are a massive collection of chemicals that are involved not just in obesity, but in breast cancer and asthma in, in a host of diseases and conditions. A researcher at Tufts University found that the tubing used to maintain her, her breast cell cultures was actually causing the cells to proliferate in ways that only estrogen could. So years of testing for her to figure out what the problem was demonstrated that there were estrogenic endocrine disrupting chemicals in the tubing that were feeding the flask. So I'm, I get the nods at Anna Soto, right? So they were onto something. And that propelled investigation into increased rates of breast cancer connected to toxic chemicals. And two more classes <clears throat> or categories of EDCs really came screaming out of the science. BPA, which we've all heard a lot about, along with what I call their second cousins, the phthalates. They were everywhere, from polycarbonate, plastic water bottles, kids' toys, cosmetics. You've heard about it all day long. Household cleaning progress, products, the fragrance in all of those products, ubiquitous and dangerous. So BPA, you may know, set out to be a hormone replacement, but it was too unstable. And not to leave any good chemical on a shelf, they decided to repurpose it and to put it into formulations from everything from water, baby bottles, water bottles, and food can linings. So we reported on those findings in 2002 and set out to actually get, that, get BPA banned in certain product classes. So in 2002, we started working with the California legislature in the city of San Francisco to ban some of these chemicals in different product classes. And we focused on phthalates in kids' toys. Why would a breast cancer organization focus on kids' toys? That's a very good question. <laughs> Why? Because, as you've heard all day, in utero and early life exposure sets up the mammary gland for later life breast cancer. And women care, dads care, moms care. You have a discretionary product <coughs> with a discretionary ingredient. It was the perfect opportunity to bring attention. The gateway chemical class to talk about chemicals and disease. So we accomplished the ultimate ban by educating and mobilizing the public. It took the better part of three years to do that EDC work, to organize it and to activate the moms. The moms groups that descend on the legislature in both California and the city of San Francisco. By 2007, the state had banned six of those phthalates. And by 2008, we had federal legislation. But it took us actually years more before we got the final, final ban on those phthalates and kids' toys. And you think, well, that was an awful long time from 2008 to 11 or 12 before we got eight phthalates banned. The advantage, of course, was that in the meantime, companies responded to the citizen action. 
They responded to the marketplace. They knew it was coming, and they began voluntarily taking those phthalates not only out of kids' toys, but out of personal care products as we launched the campaign for safe, co safe cosmetics. So Laura referred to the materials that are out on the table. You can learn about some of the things that we do and some of the chemicals that we focus on. So we also have a campaign for safe cosmetics because the European Union banned over 1,000 chemicals in personal care products. And in this country, we ban how many do you think? Under 10. Wow. Under 10 chemicals. So we mounted more of a market consumer-based campaign on personal care products. We have a bill that Jan Schakowsky is dropping next week in, in Congress, the 2018 Cosmetics Reform Act for about the fifth time that would actually do the job and you can be an activist and get involved in telling her to go ahead with that bill. But in the meantime, we worked with the marketplace. We got legislation that protect kids we got market campaigns that really started to move the personal care industry. And it is an $84 billion industry. So we all have the opportunity to adopt a personal precautionary principle approach to our lives. Every single one of us can think about it. While we're waiting for the government and while we're waiting for the alternatives, we can also make decisions about what we will buy, what we won't buy, what we'll avoid using. We can still make those decisions, even in the absence of the perfect science and certainly in the absence of an administration, a federal administration that cares about us. So I'm gonna just say, be a conscious consumer. You really can do it. It's hard. You have to think about it every single day. You have to invest some time in that. You actually have to be a conscious, conscious and conscientious voter, which means you need to know the platforms of the people you vote for. You, when that email comes around that you're going to sign up for and we're going to send you to take action on that bill, don't hit delete. The organizations that you care about are the doing the work. Don't hit delete. Take the action. Next week, we're issuing a 120-page report on toxic chemicals and fragrance. We did time of flight on, um, on chemicals that are in personal care products marketed to women of color and celebrity uh, and marketed by celebrities. It's really a fascinating piece of work to see what, uh, what's in that fragrance report and how it's going to drive the rest of our policy work. So visit Breast Cancer Prevention Bar Partners, bcpp.org, get active. <laughs> and become Thank an you. endocrine disruptor. <laughs> yes, so be an endocrine disruptor. Hi, it's such a pleasure to share a table with Jeannie and Megan, and Laura, actually. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, my organization is the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, and our motto is Science for a Healthy California. <laughs> and we are made up of a little bit more than 100 scientists, and what we do is we sit between the researchers, the UCs, and the policymakers, and we give advice uh, to the policymakers based on science. And we collaborate a lot with the universities, University of California, Berkeley, San Francisco, Davis, and both on the translation side as well as trying to look for those key leverage points where just a bit more research will enable us to do something. So that's our role, being this sort of interpreter, but also generator of, uh, of science so that we can make policy decisions. So um, just uh, by way of reflecting on my career, my whole career has been in state government. And um, I thought I'd reflect on a couple lessons. And one of them is that with strong science, you can do a lot. So if we think about, um, you know, throw your mind back to the early 90s, uh, and think what diesel buses and cars, what you would be behind if you were behind one of those. Uh, you, you try to avoid them, roll up your windows and so forth. And it took about nine years for my department to nail down the science on the degree of hazard for diesel. But we finally did. And I have to say it was a very complex scientific process involving 
a lot of peer review and discussions and opposition, but finally we nailed it down. Overnight, after we nailed it down, the ARB, the Air Resources Board, began to take action. Overnight, the risk estimates in communities were more than doubled for many communities. And that was because all of a sudden, <laughs> we realized that what that exposure, we were able to put a label and a number on it. And it drove a lot of action. Um, and just thinking back, you know, just a couple weeks ago, the Governor's Conference on Climate Change held a summit here. And science has always been really at the heart of strong, uh, it's been the foundation for strong California policies. Um, so anyway, what we learned is you can do a lot with good science, but also uh, speed is important because it doesn't mean that the people that lived in those communities weren't facing a risk before, it's just that we finally put a label on it. So that was a very uh, strong lesson. Um, and then we have uh, Proposition 65. Now Proposition 65 is a bit more of an expedited approach to decision making once you put something on the Proposition 65 list as a carcinogen or a reproductive toxicant, a variety of different actions follow from that. But it takes a good degree of evidence for something to be placed on the Proposition 65 list. So again, it's a list of reproductive toxicants and carcinogens, but there's a good deal of overlap with in endocrine disruptors that might be related to obesity. So in a way, what you want to do for action is kind of go for the low-hanging fruit and think about those overlaps and where we have enough evidence to take action now because there's co-benefits from taking action. So if we think about bisphenol A, um, it first went on the Prop 65 list a number of years ago, but it did subject, was subjected to legal challenge and uh, it still isn't on the list for Adele. It was on the list for a few days for the developmental yes, endpoints, yes, but, we but as a result of the courts, it came off. But then our uh, scientific panel uh, looked at the evidence for female reproductive toxicity and placed it on the list uh, just a few years back. Um, and there was a lot of pressure to deal with bisphenol A in cans, but Prop 65 provided a basis for a good deal of uh, reconsideration of how we, uh, of, of this whole issue. And, um, and one of the big questions was low doses. Is this having an effect at low doses? And Linda Birnbaum, as director of NIHS, and NIHS did a considerable amount of research that really nailed down the effect at low doses. So all of a sudden, it wasn't a concern of high versus low. It was at low doses, there is a concern. And this drove uh, migration out of the market and replacement. But of course, as Meg brought up, well, what is it going to be replaced with? Um, so University of California, Berkeley, Meg, helped facilitate a meeting that brought together manufacturers of cans, users of, uh, makers of, of products that uh, use bisphenol A, and it provided a forum for people to discuss and facilitated further change. So I think having a, um, a forum for discussion, I think, Meg, uh, you created a forum for comfortable discussion so that the, both the policymakers, the scientists, and the manufacturers could come together and think very carefully about how do we move forward. So it was uh, an inspiration as well for how to sort of uh, uh, move the ball on that. Um, let's see, and then I guess finally, um, and this is something that uh, Tracy facilitated with uh, my organization some time ago, and it says how, you know, in the absence of actual apical endpoints, outcomes that you see in animals, how can we take action earlier? Well, we need to move upstream. We need to look at those early indications of endocrine disruption and find a way of moving forward and understanding when you have enough evidence that you think, okay, there's enough activity here, there's enough of a red flag, I need to take action. 
So actually, I see Martin spoke, or Martin Smith spoke earlier today. Um, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, Martin Smith, Michelle O'Merrill were collaborating on an approach to look at key characteristics of endocrine disruptors and key characteristics of reproductive toxicants and understanding how those early markers of upstream activities can be combined to say, okay, I have enough evidence to understand there's adversity associated with this. It's an emerging field. We don't have everything in place yet, but we've started the process to begin to say, okay, we have enough here to take action. So those are, that's our key characteristic work. Um, and then I guess finally, I guess the, the, the last lesson is around our um, Cal and virus screen effort. This is a really a different kind of science. So what we, what we um, understand is that a variety of exposures contribute to disease and also, um, you heard from Rachel Morell Frosch earlier today as well. Um, understanding that uh, socioeconomic stressors, a variety of uh, susceptible uh, markers influence the extent of susceptibility in individuals. And different communities across the state have different levels of susceptibility as well as different levels of co-pollution. And what we've done is we've created this tool where we can look statewide across uh, California and at a census tract level pick out those communities which have an unequal burden or much more disadvantaged from uh, pollution burden as well as cumulative exposure and set them up in the absence of a full understanding of all the risks, but see what communities are most heavily impacted so that we can put some investment there to do something to improve uh, their transportation systems, the degree of exposure to toxicants all around to in, in increase enforcement uh, for toxic chemical exposures in those communities. So that's our Cal and virus screen tool, which is a, a sort of a science-based policy tool to inform where do we want to put our efforts to protect the most vulnerable. So anyway, those are some of the um, efforts that we do in my organization. And I, I have to say, you know, just in general, um, uh, sort of a take-home lesson for me is uh, really strong support for good science, very important. Um, but we have a lot of, uh, we try to convene a lot of, uh, when we take actions like Kelvin Virus Screen, we take, we convene meetings and, and what we find is that, you know, it's really hard for people to show up. So we try to convene them at a time that people can show up, but I think one of the big messages is as the government does go out there and tries to get input, please see if you can step up and give us input. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll ask a few questions, and if uh, members of the audience want to uh, chime in, please do. Uh, but I, I guess my, as I was listening to your, um, the, your talks, the one thing that was just striking to me was, I, I feel like I'm always hearing about a country in Europe that's banning something, whether it's flame retardants in my couch or the li BPA lining cans of tomatoes. Why, why, why are we so behind the curb? It's universal healthcare, right? I mean, if you think about the healthcare system and the investment in keeping people healthy, it's, it's just different. And the countries that are really doing the most around uh, chemical control and, and the health outcomes from exposure to chemicals are those that are providing uh, government-based uh, government universal health care. Well, so if you, oh, do you agree with that, I Meg? completely agree with Jeannie, and I would add um, that there's a very different role for commercial um, interests in the policy-making process in the countries where there's more Excellent. significant action on chemicals. Well, if you look at my, my world where I study the food industry and, and the beverage industry and I work with tobacco industry researchers, the reason we can't get leverage is because all the companies are, are based here. Is that a problem in this space? I would just dis space? make a distinction because it's very important in the work that I do is that not all companies are bad, but the ones that are difficult to work with are the ones who have a vested, you know, know this, vested commercial interest in the status quo. And so it's why often the people we're working to bring to the table are the 
um, the users of chemicals or the retailers or the brands who don't, they don't want hazardous chemicals in their products any more than we do. <laughs> and, um, but they don't have a vested interest in a particular chemical. They're not making money off of a phthalate or a flame retardant. Um, they're making money off their products and they'd like their products to be safer. And so that's a, it's a business interest we can bring to the table, which is often very influential in making that um, policy argument from an economic perspective, then they're not as conflicted. Yeah, and if there's consumer demand, right? Yeah. If there's consumer demand for that. I mean, we're, this fragrance report that we're releasing, we're, we're pre-discussing the results with each of the companies. So we're sending them their sheet, and they're going, I had no idea that that was in the wow. fragrance that I buy from the fragrance house who didn't tell me it was in it. So we've got an, a supply chain issue. Uh -huh. And they may want to, uh, the regrettable substitution piece, which we've all been dealing with, you both addressed it, uh, would in part, one of the, the, the underpinnings of a cure for that is transparency. So in the food world, we are in food research, we have this terrible problem <clears throat> with industry meddling. Uh, the, uh, for example, we published a paper recently uh, that showed that the Sugar Association, the trade organization for the sugar industry, had paid some very prominent Harvard scientists to suppress evidence around sugar uh, being a cause of cardiometabolic disease and to elevate, uh, you know, a focus on fat. And um, so this is a big problem in the science around food, and it is on t tobacco and alcohol as well. Do you guys, it, does this happen? I mean, Lauren, you're emphasizing the importance of science here. Is there transparency in the science, or do you have this problem of the industry getting in the middle? Or maybe anyone on the panel can answer that. Well, I mean, I, I think by our processes within government, we um, actually try to convene so that we provide a forum so both the science, you know, academic scientists as well as industry scientists can express their viewpoints. So, for example, in our Prop 65 processes, we have a lot of. Uh, industry scientists will, that will come to the meetings and they'll sh share their viewpoint pretty strongly. Um, but it's up to the scientists actually to make the decision. So we do oh. have these processes in, in California government where scientists actually <coughs> make the decision on whether or not something has a certain effect. And, and so there are those safeguards. Right. I, would, I would just highlight for everybody who doesn't know OEHA well, what an um, amazing government office it is because <laughs> it's so rare to have um, a, um, involvement in regulation of this purely scientific right. group right. and they do amazing forward-looking work that you know Lauren can't pray maybe say it that way but I think we've all experienced it that way and it's it's an amazing antidote to what you're talking exactly. about um, and I will just say there is as many people and the scientists in this room know and have experienced um, there is a, a direct sort of link between the people who have worked against the science of tobacco exposure and the ones who are working against the science of chemical exposure and I've experienced it personally with you know, letters to the editor that were written in response to work that I've published. And they were author when you look at who authored them, it's people who used to advocate for the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're doing gun control at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would echo what Meg just said about OHIA. You know, I work um, with the California Resources Board, which is another evidence-based uh, part of the um, California government, and we rely heavily on work support for uh, our regulations from OHIA science, um, including Kill and Virus Screen. Uh, but I was going to give another example of how, you know, it's really all about money often. Uh, I think most of the people in this audience know about flame retardants. Mm -hmm as a problem in California and that, you know, it's now been banned in California. We, you know, we were actually uh, part of the problem because we were requiring flame retardants to be in uh, kids' uh, clothes and mattresses and furniture, uh, and it never really achieved any benefit. Uh, but I've found out recently, maybe some of you have read this, that um, flame retardants were you know, the PDBs uh, were actually developed initially uh, as gas additives to improve the uh, efficiency of gasoline. Uh, and 
you know, because they couldn't use, they didn't want to use lead anymore, so they moved mm -hmm. to PDBEs. And, um, you know, then when they didn't need that anymore, when lead was taken out of gasoline, they repurposed it for flame retardants. So I think it's already been mentioned in this uh, meeting, but you have to watch what they do with the chemical uh, when it gets out of the market, for one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I just have a little follow-up. It's interesting thinking about the flame. We had PC PCBs. Mm -hmm. Then we had, following that, PBBs, which were flame <laughs> retardants. <laughs> and then we took the, those, you know, after they were banned, we found out how toxic they were. And then we had PBDEs, which still have a very similar structure. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Kevin Parrott. I'm uh, at the Buck Institute, and I have a new startup analyzing using metabolomics and proteomics, various things, and very interested in the exposome. Um, you mentioned Method as the company that was uh, you were partnering with. Is there any role for the fact that Method is a for-benefit corp corporation versus a C corp? Because I incorporated it as a benefit corp because I don't like getting sued by shareholders for doing good things. Absolutely, and I'll let you say more. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, I'm a very big fan of fourth sector idea um, of B Corps, and we just had seventh generation, which is a B Corp, uh, be um, uh, taken on by Unilever, but with a social mission board whose job it is to keep them on mission. So I think the B Corp movement is going to be a very, very important part of this. And some of the big companies are buying up B Corps for just that reason. So uh, I think I'd love to talk with you about that. Yeah. I think it raises an, um, an interesting point because, um, you know, we taught, and you led with this question a bit, Laura, is like, what can consumers mm -hmm. do? Right. And I just, I, I like to emphasize kind of the dual role of consumers, which Jeannie is hinting at also, and that B Corps are about. You can make choices with your dollars, and you can do it in ways that um, acknowledge the full life cycle of a product. Like, I buy organic food, and I, yes, I hope that my preschooler eats you know, fewer pesticide residues, but mainly I really hope that the farm workers are sprayed with fewer pesticides and that their families living near agricultural fields have fewer, you know, breathe less pesticide drift and have less pesticides, fewer pesticides in their water. And so really that's my driver um, in the same way as we're looking to eliminate, you know, formaldehyde from the clothing supply chain because it's a worker exposure issue. So there's a role for that. And I was really struck by the previous speaker who made that, um, that it's when you divide the amount of carbon reduction that we need by the number of people and you could make a simple choice every day that would get us well on our way toward that. I think that's important and I don't want to remove it, but I think there's another role for consumers, which is like consumer advocates. And right. there's a quip in our field that's like we can't shop our way out of this problem right. um, because of, you know, what was mentioned earlier about DDT is in all of this. You can't make purchasing decisions to get away from exposure to DDT. And so you can do stuff as a consumer to ask, um, you know, you can buy method cleaners, but you can, but method is already doing a great job. And you can ask Walmart and Target and Costco, do they know what's in the cleaners that they sell? Right. Um, do, do they know that their ingredients are safe? How do they know? And get forced this issue, use your power as a consumer, not just to buy, but to ask the questions where they don't even realize they don't know. Um, like That's what Gina's right. talking about, you right. supply the information, they go, we didn't know that we had all that toxic stuff in our product. So asking to know, as a consumer, you, can, you have that power. Uh, and the, the next big thing that I think is going to come up uh, is a response uh, to chair drobes. To what? Does anybody have a chair drobe? Okay, what? we are not millennials, apparently. <laughs> Chair drobes are where millennials throw their clothes. They throw them on the chair, right? Oh. <laughs> and they don't want, they, they say they don't want to wash them because it's four flights with quarters to the, to the laundry and they don't have time. But they're looking for a way to freshen those clothes. That's going to come up. It's going to be like dockers. But they're all proud of their chair drobes <laughs> and their floor drobes. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Do any millennials in the room want to speak? Keep your ear open <laughs> for the, the company that's going to address chair drobes. Millennials are allowed to speak now. <laughs> <laughs> I see you guys back there. <laughs> any comments? Any comments? Yeah? Oh, 
Oh, not as it relates to that. I'm not a millennial, but I love them. <laughs> um, quick question. Um, is there a connection between, this is to the lovely lady that just spoke, is there a connection between the aluminum found in, um, in deodorants and breast cancer? <laughs> you get that one. Yeah, I know I get that one. It, you know, having a heavy metal, having any kind of metal that you don't need for as an antiperspirant, right, is basically not a good idea. Is there a direct correlate between underwire bras deodorant and breast cancer, no, there's no demonstrable. But does it make intuitive sense not to, not to use it? Yeah, you know, but I, no, there's no science that we would say there's a connection between those deodorants and breast cancer. Yeah. Um, a question, I, um, and always looking at the world as far as solutions, um, I was thinking, uh, Jeff Bezos is going to own the world at some point. <laughs> and so I, in the meantime, though, he's, well, maybe always, he has a huge platform. And what I was thinking about as I was sitting here is that I can't leave the house without my lipstick. That's the one thing I have to have. And okay. uh, there's a lot of chemicals in lipstick. And normally I just go for the color, so I, don't, I ignore that. But I do read negative... Um, uh, you know, input, yeah. reviews. And so what if oh. all this stuff that is in products, people just put negative reviews down <laughs> and say what's in it? Great idea. Um, okay. I would just add that you have to know <laughs> what's in it well, that's to know where to write the reviews. Right. And You're that's right. what we're really lacking. Uh, and that gets okay. to ingredient disclosure and the need for transparency. Because then you could okay. use that information for decision making. But we currently don't have that information. So it's really hard to exert your power as a consumer if you don't know what's in the product. Right. And there are companies that are 100% transparent. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the Safe Cosmetics site, you'll find the, the companies that are fully transparent. And the legislation would force that transparency. So if it has the word fragrance, count on the fact that it's hiding chemicals. Just count on it. Don't buy it. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. What um, really bugs me probably, as most people, um, are plastic water bottles. And we see those everywhere. I know that San Francisco has been very progressive, even the airport, so we can fill up our stainless steel water bottles, which is great, and I would like to see more of that all over the country, um, so we're not having to buy, when we go to the airport, for example, you know, uh, water that's in plastic. But I would like to ask in chemistry um, if, if there's a, an alternative for BPA. Um, BPS has not, you know, proven to be a safe alternative, so what are you doing there? Um, just so we don't mix up, the disposable plastic bottles are not generally made of bisphenol A polymers. It's the hard plastic like Nalgene, and they've generally moved to BPS and BPF. But the question stands, and um, it's interesting that you ask that right now, because one of our Greener Solutions projects this semester is in partnership with Method to look at how to create a plastic packaging that would not contribute to ocean plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking at how to create a polymer that would biodegrade safely into non-toxic materials that wouldn't then serve also as a sink for toxic chemicals in the environment and prove that their entry point into the food web, wow. into food webs. So um, stay tuned. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. So um, Meg, you spoke on this a bit, you know, in talking about the, the advocacy, but, you know, um, I work with low income patients and, you know, they don't necessarily have the buying power to right. buy um, you know, organic or, you know, more costly cosmetics that don't have these toxic chemicals. So what can people who don't have the economic resources do? Well, I think there's actually some of the uh, Walgreens, CVS have also created some standards. So you don't have to go to Whole Foods or shop at the high end of a salon product to get ones that are lower in, in chemicals. We, we have a program that we're starting with the dollar stores. Oh. Or against the dollar stores. I don't know. Right. It'll it'll be either with them or against them, depending on on how they respond to it. But for just that reason, for just that reason, there's also another project called the Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, with which is working to actually protect salon workers and provide ingredient options or or product options uh, because. 
people in, in African American communities spend a lot of time in the beauty salon, and we're really working on that. It's also the reason why the collective action is so important, because if you can't purchase organic Food, it's all the more reason to do the advocacy to reduce pesticide use across the board. So thank you for coming today, thank and you. more importantly, thank you for everything you do. Can I make my... Can I make my so um, I had I alluded earlier to the industry documents work that we do here at UCSF. We have a very robust uh, uh, program of studying industries that are commercial um, determinants of health. Uh, tobacco, the, it started with the tobacco archive. Uh, Tracy and her colleagues just a, a week or two ago launched a chemical industry archive. This is a digital archive that's open to the public. People all around the, the world at, can access information and internal documents about what these companies are doing, uh, emails, messages. So in um, next on November 15th, in this very room, we are going to be announcing and launching a food industry documents library. It has the sugar documents in it that we've been uh, publishing off of. It has, it'll have 300,000 pages to start with on internal industry documents on producers of junk food and sugar-sweetened beverages. And you'll be able to Log in and get it, but more importantly, I want to invite you all to come and be at our launch event. We're going to have Marion Nessel here. She's from NYU, who's written a, a stack of books on the food industry, food politics, and she's going to be announcing her newest book called Unsavory Truth, and it's a look inside using the documents in this library. It's a look inside uh, how the food and beverage industries buy off dietitians, scientists, nutrition scientists scientists, doctors, health professionals. And then we're going to also have Anahat O'Connor from the New York Times, who's used the documents in his investigative reporting and so forth. So you'll get an invitation. There are some paper invitations here and on the t table out there. And we would love to have you come back for that.